Okay, let's get started. Can you hear me? Okay, that sounds better. Okay, this is going to be our last lecture on execution paradigms. We're going to cover systolic arrays and decoupled access and execute. And you will see the importance of this topic uh, as we go along. And then we'll start memory. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have enough lectures to do justice to memory, so we'll give you an overview of what memory is all about. But we already covered a bunch of stuff in memory. Uh, we will do a little bit more. Okay, uh, some announcements. You already know that there is a seminar course that's coming up that's focused on critical thinking and understanding of papers. So if you do well in this course, and if you're interested in taking the path of following more on computing platforms, computing architectures, computer systems, specialized machines for doing really high performance tasks that nothing else in the world can do, then I would recommend the seminar. And if you're also interested in learning more and doing research and other things in computer architecture, I will have three suggestions. One is taking that course, for sure. Second is taking the next course that I teach, which is the master's level course. Third is emailing me. <laughs> it's out of order, as you can see. We know out of order execution in this course. So if you're interested, please email me with your interests. Email Juan also as a CC, because it's always good to have redundancy for reliability, as you know, right? It's always good to have multiple emails also. Redundancy in time and space, those are good things. And I already said this. And do readings and assignments on your own. That's a really good way of learning more, uh, taking more out of these lectures and the course, especially if you have interest in going towards these directions. And there are certainly many exciting projects and research positions that, uh, that I have in my group, as well as I can recommend you uh, other places where you can learn, but we span memory systems, hardware security, many of the topics that we discuss in this course, GPUs, FPGAs, heterogeneous systems, new execution paradigms like in-memory computation, which we didn't get a chance to cover in this course, but uh, it's really important going into the future, especially at a research setting, to change the paradigm of how we do computation as opposed to, as opposed to taking existing paradigms as a given, because things are very different in the world today than when the existing paradigms were designed 70 or 80 years ago in the past. But changing the paradigm is always difficult in research, so you actually need to do really strong research to be able to change the paradigms. And uh, clearly, we've seen some interactions in this course that are security, architecture, reliability, energy, performance, dot, dot, dot. And these are very interrelated today. How do you actually make the best trade-offs in this difficult trade-off space is a, is a really interesting research problem. And we do, we do a lot of work on architectures for medical, health, and genomics. If, that's, if that fancies your interest, that's actually a very uh, good area to be in, especially today and going forward. Uh, we didn't talk much about this, of course, but you can imagine this sort of architectures for genome sequence analysis, for example, can be very, very important going into the future. Imagine having a device that can analyze your genome in less than a minute and give you suggestions based on your current conditions and your personal uh, whatever, right, personal uh, vulnerabilities and personal uh, treatments in the past so far, right? All of your personal information plus your genome and a device that can do this in one minute, giving suggestions, right? That's a dream today. It doesn't exist, but it could be done, right? Remember I said earlier, applications dream and they will come. I believe that if you dream, they will come. You will develop the technology so that they're enabled. Okay. So we're almost done with this. We're going to finish this part uh, very soon. And that part consists of decoupled access and execute and systolic arrays. I'm going to reorder them uh, a little bit uh, because I think systolic arrays will, will cover most of our time uh, today. Okay, these are the readings for today. Uh, I required the first reading that I hadn't required in the past, but this is a beautiful paper that was written uh, about almost 40 years ago now, right? 36 years ago. Uh, Although the research that went into that paper started in 1970s uh, by H.T. Kung, who was at Carnegie Mellon University uh, at that time. Uh, and this paper has affected a lot of things, uh, as you will see also in today's lectures. Uh, and when I used to teach this lecture uh, at Carnegie Mellon, there was no real example of a systolic array architecture. Uh, I started do, do, teaching systolic arrays at Carnegie Mellon in 2009 or so. And uh, there was always a question, why, why, why are we teaching this, right? But it was such a fundamental topic that it had to be taught, in my opinion. And now you will see that everybody is designing systolic architectures to accelerate machine learning tasks, 
So that's another important thing, uh, maybe to, a lesson to take away in this lecture is education is not supposed to teach just what exists out there. It's supposed to teach what is really fundamental, as I've taught you all along in this course, right? And that fundamental thing will strike back at some point because it's so fundamental that it's going to be used. And I always believe that, and Google proved that, other people have proved that right now. Not that, uh, I'm not suggesting that because Google does it, it's validated. Actually, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. But it was so fundamental that they had to take it and use it. Okay, uh, and this is a recommended reading by Google, actually, that talks about how to take a systolic architecture and design a tensor processing unit to accelerate machine learning tasks. Okay, so we'll talk about systolic arrays. It's a beautiful concept, actually. This is one of those concepts uh, that, uh, where the biological principles inspired designing, com designing a computational paradigm. And the goal uh, of a systolic array, when it was first designed, was to design an accelerator that has several properties. Simple, regular design, like GPUs, in a sense. Uh, they wanted to keep the number of unique parts small and regular, so that you don't need to design many, many different parts. High concurrency, so that you can achieve high performance, essentially high parallelism. Again, similar to GPUs. Goals are similar to GPUs a little bit. And most importantly, balanced computation and I.O., memory bandwidth. Essentially, I.O. bandwidth, memory bandwidth at, the, at that time was important. It's still important. And as you've seen in SIMD machines, it's extremely important, especially if you want high con concurrency. And whenever you want to design a machine that operates on a lot of data, you're almost always limited by the memory bandwidth. Again, this is very fundamental. It's not going to change anytime soon. As a result, it may be good to examine architectures that minimize uh, the data movement from memory. And that's exactly what they did when they designed the systolic arrays, H.T. Kung. Uh, he basically said that, oh, we should balance the computation and I.O. bandwidth. Instead of going to memory to get a data, operate on that data, and store it back. We don't store it back. We pass it back to, we pass it to some other processing element. And that processing element uses that data, produces some data, passes it to the next processing element. That processing element takes that data, uses that data, passes it to the next pr processing element. Now you see that one piece of data coming from memory flows through a bunch of processing elements and eventually gets output to memory, as opposed to doing get the data, process it, put it back to memory. Get the data again, process it, put it back to memory. Get the data again, process it, and put it back to memory. Make sense? That's the idea, basically. The idea is to replace a single processing element with a regular sequence or array of processing elements and carefully orchestrate the data flow between the processing elements such that you don't need to access memory many, 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 many times. You access memory once and do a lot of operations on that data through many processing elements, a linear array or a two-dimensional array or maybe a three-dimensional array or maybe some combination of these different arrays, as we will see and then put the data back, such that these processing elements collectively transform a single piece of input data before outputting it to the memory. So the biggest benefit is you maximize the amount of computation you do on a single piece of data element that comes from memory. So that's the idea of systolic arrays. And pictorially, it looks like this, basically. Basically, if you have a single processing element, and if you have some memory bandwidth and latency over here, Instead of doing this, every time you output some data from the processing element going, uh, going back and reloading the data, you do this. You basically chain the processing elements such that the output of this processing element is directly supplied to this processing element and then th uh, to this processing element, to this processing element, to this processing element, and eventually when you're done, you output the data. As you can see in this picture that says 5 million operations per second at most, whereas here you get 30 million operations per second at most because you actually do six things on a piece of data as opposed to one thing on the same piece of data. Right? That's the idea, very simple idea. Well, why is this inspired by biology? Because uh, this is called systolic, because systolic uh, essentially relates to heart, right? If you think of memory, memory is really the heart, it's pumping blood, and blood is the data, and processing elements are the cells. And clearly, our heart is not designed to pump data to every single cell separately, right? It doesn't have that kind of network. Our heart essentially pumps blood to the veins, and the veins are connected to the processing elements, which are cells, 
And the blood flows through the cells and it eventually goes back to the heart and then gets cleaned, whatever, and then you reload, right? So that's the idea. And that's a beautiful analogy, I think. And the analogy works. If the heart was connected to every single cell in different ways, that would be terrible, right? The bandwidth you would get out of the heart or the computation that you do based on a piece of blood would be very little. But now we do a lot of computation based on the single piece of blood because that blood flows through the entire body, if you will, before it gets back to the heart. Okay. It's very intuitive if you think of it that way. So basically, memory passes data through the processing elements. Uh, okay, we already said this. Data flows through the computer memory in a rhythmic fashion, passing through many processing elements before it returns to memory. And we've already said this. It's similar to blood flow. Uh, heart pumps blood. Many cells are the processing elements, and the blood or data comes back to the heart. Different cells process the blood, and many veins operate simultaneously. And this can be many dimensional, even though I showed single dimensional over here, a single array. It could be many dimensional, right? We will see that in a little bit. So why is this interesting? Because special purpose architectures that operate on a lot of data, they need simple designs, as I said earlier, regular designs, and this is relatively regular. They need high concurrency, high performance, and they need balanced computation and I.O. memory bandwidth to obtain high concurrency. And this enables you balanced computation and I.O. bandwidth. You have many processing elements such that you can make the best use of the single piece of data element that you get out of memory. This is also an example of a MISD architecture, the best example that I uh, can actually give you in this course. Uh, remember, we talked about SISD, single instruction operates on single data, MIMD, multiple instructions, streams operate on multiple data elements, multi-threading is an example of it, SISD pipelining was an example of it. We talked about SIMD, single instruction uh, operates on multiple data elements, GPUs, vector processors, array processors, but we said MISD doesn't really exist, maybe. Multiple instructions operate on a single piece of data. This is the closest example. You get a single piece of data, and you go through this processing element array, and multiple instructions collectively transform that single piece of data to some other data element. So you can think of these processing elements doing different instructions on the data. And they could actually be doing different instructions on the data. So this is a very good example of a MISD architecture. Okay, so the basic principle is very simple. You replace a single processing element with a regular array of processing elements and carefully orchestrate the flow of data. This is really important because you need to really carefully orchestrate the flow of data so that this works well. So control is important here uh, between the processing elements. And we already said the balancing computation and memory band. So this looks very much like pipelining, right? Uh, it is actually a form of pipelining, except the pipelining is not at the instruction stage level. You don't pipeline, fetch, decode, execute, dot, dot, dot. But it's really at the processing element level, if you will. Each processing element can actually be a pipelined engine, even though we're not going to see that uh, in this talk. Uh, basically, the big difference is each, uh, each thing over here is not a pipeline stage. It's really a processing element, full processing element. It could actually be a full processor, if you will, in the extreme form of it. And we're going to build up to that. And array structure can be nonlinear and multidimensional. This is where I actually it really changes, differs from pipelining. It's, you're really not pipelining the flow of data. You're really orchestrating the movement of data between different things that should operate on the data. As a result, you could actually have a two-dimensional array, for example. Uh, if you're doing matrix computation, for example, you could put the x's uh, or columns from the top and rows from the bottom and do some computation. Or one matrix, one array from the top and one array from the this site, and then do the computation. We will see that Google's TPU is designed very similarly that way. And uh, processing element connections can be multi-directional. They don't have to be uh, linear like this. You could actually have a connection between this processing element and a processing element downstream, and maybe a processing element that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's on the diagonal from this processing element, right? This picture doesn't show that clearly, but the reading that you're doing will show that. And depending on the nature of computation, those things may make sense. Right. For matrix multiplication, for example, you may need a particular flow of data uh, so that you get uh, the correct output at the end. And also, uh, if you want to actually extend this model, processing elements, each processing element over here can have local memory, maybe small amount of memory, and it can execute a kernel. So it, it doesn't need to be a part of an instruction, but it could actually be a small program that this processing element executes before passing on the data to the next processing element. And we will see the stage execution model in a little bit. That's essentially, systolic arrays have led to uh, 
models, execution models like stage execution that enable this. Okay, so let me give you an example of systolic computation that's, that has become extremely popular much more recently. I mean, it was popular before, but it's become much more popular recently because of the advent of neural networks. And this is convolution. Well, convolution is a very fundamental operation. I'm going to define it uh, formally at the bottom in a little bit. But it's a very fundamental operation that has always been used in filtering, pattern matching, correlation, polynomial evaluation, dot, dot, dot. Image processing tasks, especially. Uh, vision image processing tasks. And more recently, I mean, it was always used for machine learning before also, but more recently it was popularized for machine learning because you can actually have convolutional layers in convolutional neural networks. It, this is essentially image processing or video processing. You take an image and you try to identify what that is, and you do this by applying many, many convolutions to different parts of the image and trying to figure out what that image could potentially be. That's essentially what a conventional neural network is. Remember, we, we talked about perceptrons. I think of uh, perceptrons a very, very simple form of averaging or filtering, or maybe if you really stretch it, convolution. If you have a mo much more accurate uh, way of doing this filtering, that would be convolution. And if you have many, many layers of these convolution, uh, that could actually lead to something like a convolutional neural network. I'll give you a picture of this. But what is convolution? Convolution is actually formally specified as this. Given a sequence of weights, and the input sequence, that's something that you're trying to determine, uh, you compute the result sequence as this. Basically, yi is equal to weight 1 times xi plus weight 2 times xi plus 1 plus dot, 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 weight k times xi plus k minus 1. Basically, you're convolving two input vectors. One is the weight vector, and the other is uh, the input vector. Now, weight vector can tell you something, right? It could tell you, oh, these weights correspond to the probability of this input uh, matching this part of a cat or this part of a dog or something like that, right? So basically you learn these weights somehow by training the network in a convolutional neural network. But convolution itself is essentially a filtering task. You're really filtering the input sequ sequence with some weights and outputting the filtered result. Okay, let me motivate a little bit more convolution uh, and then we'll go into how you can implement this with systolic array. So these are used, for example, this is one of the not even the state-of-the-art uh, convolutional neural network. In this case, you have an input uh, that has 1,024 times 8 bits. Uh, and if you actually uh, try, to, try to map this to a truth table, it will have many, many entries. So maybe it's not a good idea if you try to map it to different bits. So what convolutional neural networks do is they basically perform convolutions on different parts of these images with different feature maps, with different weights, if you will. And then you go through different stages, convolution, sampling, convolution, sampling, and then some other stuff at the end. And eventually the output tells you, oh, this character that you've input is an A or not. This is a convolutional neural network. We're not going to go into how this exactly works. For that, you should take a machine learning class. But we're going to take the fundamental operation of convolution and accelerate it. And clearly, this works. Uh, you can actually see the demos over here. You can see that these are different layers and how they operate, and this is the input, and this is the final output, you can see. So it's a working example of a convolutional neural network that determines what the characters are, uh, handwritten characters are, and uh, basically shows you the answer. And sometimes it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't know, as you can see, right? There's a question mark. But these can be very accurate, uh, and you could actually map this to a matrix multiplication. That's one example of implementing a convolutional network layer. You can see that uh, these are the input features, input vector x that I defined earlier. It may look like this. this is, these are the convolution filters, the weight vectors, w, that you've determined somehow based on the training of your network with many, 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 many images. And then you basically take the input features and do matrix multiplication to get the output features in one layer of the network. That's, you're essentially doing convolution. You're implementing convolution by matrix multiplication and you can actually study this uh, over here. This is actually what's happening, as you can see. You're multiplying W with X over here. Makes sense, right? So matrix multiplication is actually one way of implementing this. We're going to see another way of implementing this through systolic arrays. You can certainly implement matrix multiplication with a systolic array uh, also. OK, so this is actually one slide that uh, Juan suggested that I put, and I put it because I like, the, I like two things on this slide. Uh, but, well, basically, let me explain the slide first. Basically, uh, uh, Andreas Moshovos, who's a friend, uh, adopted 
uh, Wen Mei Hu, who was our guest lecturer a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, guest lecturer meaning distinguished lecturer, if you attended his uh, class, uh, and Wen Mei teaches a programming massively parallel, uh, that should be programming massively parallel computers, right? Something like that, processors, course. Uh, and Andreas adopted that course, and he taught that course, and several of Jeff Hinton's graduate students took the course. Jeff Hinton did some seminal work in machine learning uh, at the University of Toronto. And the students implemented, uh, developed a impl uh, GPU implementation of a convolutional neural network, a deep one. I think it's 20 layers or so. We'll see in the next slide. And they trained it with many, many images, 1.2 million images. And they actually went on to uh, win the ImageNet competition. This is the biggest competition that's out there to prove that your machine learning algorithm is actually good. And you want to achieve very high accuracy in recognizing the images, right? Whether it's a cat or a dog is one example. I like this because it shows the power of convolutions because all of the things that have won these uh, won this competition are convolutional neural networks of the form that I showed you earlier over here, except they may have really deep layers. Instead of having five layers like that, they may actually have hundreds of layers. Uh, and the second thing, second really important takeaway over here is th what, what enabled this innovation and creativity and discovery was an applied course that was taught at the University of Toronto that was inspired by a course that was developed at the University of Illinois uh, with help from NVIDIA. I think this is really, really important. Having applied courses is critical. And I really hope you have a lot of applied courses at ETH and not be focused as much on exams because exams are only some part of the learning, right? I see a lot of focus on exams at ETH, which really makes me a little bit annoyed, frankly, <laughs> because the really important part comes from actually taking the concepts and applying them somehow and actually developing something that really didn't exist, right? An exam, even though it may test your knowledge, it will never directly achieve that. But a course that has an applied component where you actually do a project and you actually show that, oh, I did better than whoever won the ImageNet before, has a lot more interesting creative power than an exam will ever, 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 ever give you. So keep this in mind. And I think more advanced courses should definitely have these more, uh, more applied components. And I think the potential at ETH is very, very high in terms of doing things like this. Okay, so basically this is the paper they wrote, and they showed that in 2012 they could be much better than the run-up in terms of the accuracy of recognition using their network. And of course, later people have developed other methods. Google Net is one example. Essentially, this is a paper by Google or led by Google where they showed that they could be even more accurate. And you can see results that look like this. This was AlexNet, the, the paper they wrote at the time. It had eight layers, and its top five classification error was about 16%. Basically, you get an image, uh, you, 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 you map it to some output, and the probability that, of that output being at the top five uh, possible outputs uh, is 16%, or inaccuracy is 16%, which is still pretty high. Later, this is Google's result, Google Net. It has a 22-layer convolutional neural network, and the accuracy or misprediction rate is much lower, 6.7%. And later, ResNet, which is not on the slides, uh, the misprediction rate is about 3.5%, and that has 152 layers, as opposed to those five layers. And you can see that that's the first uh, convolutional neural network. That was a jump. This was, not a, this was a shallow network. You can see that first convolutional neural network actually provided a lot of uh, improvements, and then improvements increased over time. And a human is actually worse than ResNet right now. Depends on, of course, which humans they've tested, I assume. But <laughs> you can see that ResNet is better than humans. <laughs> I'm going to bet that I'll, tr I'll try to be better than this. <laughs> OK. OK, basically, hopefully, you know the importance of the convolutions. Uh, but it all boils down to this thing in the end. What it boils down to doing this computation. This is a very formal, specific definition this convolution definition, which is filtering an input vector with a sequence of weights, or a weight vector. So let's see how we can implement this. Uh, so you could certainly implement this with a GPU. I'll go back in two slides. This is actually the first GPU implementation. These guys at the University of Toronto who took that course did the GPU implementation with the course. Uh, and GPU is good, but what if you design a specialized architecture for this? Wouldn't that be much better? We saw the GPUs and we saw the downsides of the GPUs also. 
So this is one example of a specialized architecture for this. It's very, very simple. It consists of exactly the same processing elements. And the processing element looks like this. And this simple processing element does a multiply and accumulate. Basically, the Y input comes from the right. Y output is computed as Y input times the weight that's stored in the processing element times the input coming from X. And that's your output. And X output is directly passed to X input. That's it. That's our processing element. We don't need anything else. But we're going to connect these processing elements like this. And we're going to supply the data, carefully orchestrate the movement of the data into and out of these processing elements. And if you do it like this, this is essentially your single convolution. This computes the convolution of uh, an X input vector with a W weight vector that's stored inside the processing elements and the outputs the result in consecutive Y elements. So every clock, what happens is, uh, so we've supplied uh, the data moments, every clock, uh, the, uh, the X input moves from left to right and the Y input moves from right to left and a computation happens in this form in the data, in the processing element. Now, if you go and do simulate this in your head, what will happen and what you will see is y1 will be equal to, at the end, w1x1 plus w2x2 plus w3x3. Now, let's take a look at this. So in the first clock cycle, the input to w1, the input to this processing element is x1. The second input is y1. At the end of the clock cycle, what you will get over here is y1, uh, well, y1 is initial zero. I, I, I forgot to say that. Uh, y1 is initial zero, but it's input, uh, so you need some other signals to control this clearly. Uh, what you will get in the y out over here is uh, zero plus w1x1, right? So we got the w1x1 term. So x1 moves out, we're gonna drop it, because we'll done, we're done. Now we have w1x1 over here, which is, is, is the value of y1, and x2 moves here in the same clock cycle, so at the beginning of the second clock cycle, we have y1 equals w1x1. We have x2 over here, and we have w2 over here. That's constant. At the end of the second clock cycle, what we have over here would be uh, y1 over here is equal to w1x1 plus uh, w2x2. That was our x2 input. That's our output, and x2 moves over here. Right. In the next clock cycle, x3 is here. y1, w1x1 plus w2x2 is over here. So at the end of that clock cycle computation, what will happen is y1 equals to w1x1 plus w2x2 plus w3x3, which was supplied here at the beginning of the clock cycle, and x3 moves over here. So at the end of the first output, you will get this. And you can simulate this to figure out that you will actually get this at y2, and you will actually get this at y3. And if you have a continuous stream of inputs, of x's and y's, you will essentially convolve uh, the uh, x vector with the weight vector, and the output will be part of y. And this is a very specialized architecture, as you can see. It's extremely simple. If you can actually beat this, that's good. <laughs> but it's very hard to beat, as you can see, in terms of hardware complexity, because what you do is you design one element, stamp it out. And you can have a million of these if you want to do the computation for a million vector elements at the same time, right? So it's beautiful, actually. It's very principled. And this is just one of the designs. If you're, you're going to read the paper, but this says design W1. I don't know why it's called W1. I don't remember. But there are many, many designs of this with different trade-offs. Uh, in this case, one of the trade-offs is every cycle, you get an output for Y. So your Y output th throughput is constant here. Uh, but you need to orchestrate when your x's are input. You input y from the side every cycle, but your x's should be interleaved by one cycle so that you get the x at the time uh, when, when your y input is ready uh, at the beginning of the processing element. And if you want to think about this, bit, you can think about that. So it's beautiful, basically. This is, this is essentially, this, you could put this in your neural network machine and it will work beautifully again. And this is another design uh, that actually overlaps the execution of the multiply and add. If you look over here, this is doing a multiply and an add. It's called a multiply and accumulate, or a MAC operation, which is very, very common in matrix operations or filtering operations like this. Uh, the one downside of this is uh, 
uh, essentially you cannot, uh, it, it could take a long time to do this operation, right? If you would like to overlap them, you can design a systolic array that looks a little bit more complicated and add some more latches over here, such that you essentially do the multiplication first uh, and the addition next. And while you're doing uh, one addition, you do another multiplication. As a result, you do uh, overlap the multiplication and the additions that are happening in parallel. And you don't have to wait for the full latency of a multiply and accumulate. That's the idea. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay, and you can study this. This is your required reading. And I think you will learn a lot from this reading. So clearly, uh, as I showed you in this example, one needs to carefully orchestrate when data elements are input to the array. If, if that's not true, it's not going to work. In fact, that's, that's part of the art of making this work. When do you input what? And we will have a, an optional homework question where you will orchestrate when to, when to input the data elements into the array such that uh, it works. And you will see how beautiful it is. And of course, you need to make sure when the, uh, you need to buffer the output at the right time. Because in this design, outputs are coming, in the previous design that I showed, outputs are coming every cycle, which is easy. But in some other designs, outputs may be coming every n cycles, right? Then you need to ensure that you don't miss the output. You do the buffering correctly. Of course, this gets more involved if the tasks are more complicated. Convolution is not the simplest task, but not the most complicated task either. Uh, if you want to have operate on many dimensional arrays, as opposed to single dimensional arrays that we've discussed right now, this becomes more complicated. If the processing elements become less predictable in terms of latency, this becomes more complicated. In this case, it, they, were not, they, were not, they were very predictable, right? They're doing the same operation. But what if this becomes a little bit more programmable? Think about it, then things become uh, harder to manage. Uh, and so, yeah, but you need to manage it. And people have shown that these things work. Make sense? Okay, so let's jump into a little bit more uh, interesting stuff. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but clearly uh, you don't have to be one dimensional, you can, have, you can be two dimensional. You can have two dimensional systolic arrays. For example, here, you can input uh, values y from the top and values x from the left. And you can orchestrate the data movement such that, uh, for example, an, an x element over here is operated on the first element of y in the first cycle, the second element of y in the next cycle, the third element in the next cycle, the fourth element in the next cycle. That's certainly possible to do, right? Uh, so basically, if you orchestrate the movement uh, of the data, you can actually do a matrix multiplication within an, an array that looks like this, very simply, or some other matrix operation. Again, I'm not gonna go through that, but you can convince yourself to do that, or read the Google paper. That doesn't really tell you exactly how to do that, but by reading this, uh, HD Kung paper, you can actually understand even more, I think. Uh, okay, so you can actually see there are different types of this. Uh, it could be diagonal like this. It depends on the computation that you use. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this, but you can read this uh, over here. Yeah, the choice of one or two dimensional scheme is very dependent on how cells and memories will be implemented. Because it really depends on the computation that you perform. For example, two dimensional convolution can be performed by a one dimensional systolic array or a two dimensional systolic array that looks like this. And you can think of uh, how to do that. Okay, you can actually be more fancy. You can chain together different systolic arrays to do more complex uh, computations and to design much more powerful systems. For example, uh, that's a typo over here. This particular systolic array is capable of producing on the fly least squares fit to uh, all the data that has arrived up to any given moment. And this is the data that's arriving, as you can see. X's are the data uh, that's arriving. Uh, and you can actually see how it's trying to do that least square fits. This is the step one. That does orthogonal triangularization of the data. Have you guys taken li linear algebra? Okay, so you know what an orthogonal triangularization is? Probably not. But basically, by using basic linear algebra techniques, you can actually do orthogonal triangularization of the matrices. And that outputs some result, and then you need to solve the resulting linear system to get the output to figure out what is the least square fits to the input uh, data over here. That's the idea. And here, the computation is very regular, as you can see. That's beautiful. And your array, well, I don't want to call this an array, but your systolic array is also regular. It's not perfectly regular, as you can see, but you can combine multiple different regular things to do a very powerful, complex, regular computation. Or you decompose the 
computation that may, be, that may look less regular into regular pieces, like orthogonal triangulation and a solution of the triangular linear system. But to be able to do that, you need to design the right processing elements, which I'm not going to go through. You can take a look at it in the paper. Uh, and you need to orchestrate the data moment. For example, you can see that in the first cycle, you have x11 over here. You don't input x12 in the same cycle. You input x12 in the next cycle. This is time over here. You input x13 in the next cycle, x14 in the next cycle, and y1, the output, comes in the next cycle. And output kind of comes into the input, and then it goes uh, to the output at the end, as we've seen in the convolution example. So basically, you can build very powerful systems, very specialized systems. This can do only this least square fits, right? That's it. And it can only do the least square fit with particular methods, meaning this orthogonal triangularization and the solution, uh, 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 a solution of a triangle linear system. You, don't, you cannot do it with any other method with this systolic array, unless you make it programmable. But you can see that it's very powerful. It's extremely energy efficient also. I'm not going to give you energy results, but this is very, very energy efficient because these are really, really simple, right? If you throw a GPU at this, that's going to be maybe powerful. It's not going to be as powerful as this, but it's definitely not going to be as energy efficient as this, right? because you can design these things to be really, really efficient. OK, so let's give you the high-level pros and cons. We're going to do another pros and cons uh, in a few slides after you cover some more things. So the big advantage of this, well, two big advantages in my uh, perspective is, one is it's a really principled design. It efficiently makes use of limited memory bandwidth and, uh, and balances computation and I.O. bandwidth availability, uh, com balances computation to the I.O. bandwidth availability. It doesn't do the stupid thing. A CPU might perhaps do, right? Go to memory, do one operation, store the result back to memory. That's the stupid thing if you're limited by memory bandwidth. The reasonable, principled thing is get the data, do many, 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 many things on it, as much as you can do, transform it into something on top of which you cannot do any more things, and then put it back to memory. That's the idea. And specialized is what I also said. Computation now needs to fit the processing element organization and functions. And this is good because it gives you improved performance, improved efficiency. It gives you a simple design, high concurrency, everything at the same time, as long as your computation fits the processing element uh, organization. So it enables you to do good, uh, 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 and you do it more with less memory bandwidth requirements. So the downside is actually, the principal part is not the downside. The part, downside is really the specialized part over here. Specialization enables you to do relatively few things, right? Because uh, now you're not generally applicable because computation that you do needs to fit uh, the processing element functions and the organization. And if it doesn't fit, too bad. Your architecture is not going to be a good fit for arbitrary operations. OK, let's move into more programmability in systolic arrays. Essentially, each processing element in a systolic array can be generalized to store multiple weights. What I showed you is single weight. You can actually have multiple weights, and you could actually do more operations. You can select the weights on the fly, depending on some condition. So you can actually do conditional operations in a processing element. Now, this can enable you to do adaptive filtering. Based on some input condition, you multiply by this weight. Otherwise, you multiply by this weight. Right? And you can actually do arbitrary complex conditional operations and do adaptive filtering of an image, for example. You can apply many, many different filters to the image depending on what you're trying to do and what the image looks like, right? It's very powerful. And in fact, this was first developed at CMU with the goal of having vision processing and robotics tasks in mind. And I will give you an example computer that was designed to do vision processing and robotics, which is essentially what machine learning is all about today, right? So taken further, each processing element can actually have its own data and instruction memory. Now we're going to generalize it more at the expense of less efficiency, clearly. You could have data memory to store partial or temporary results or constants. And this idea now leads to what is called stream processing or pipeline parallelism. You may actually hear these terms. These are very commonly used terms. They were actually enabled because of the systolic array designs of 1970s. More generally, staged execution. You may hear that term also. So I'll give you an example of a pipeline parallel program, uh, which is a very common thing today, but it's actually inspired by systolic arrays. Uh, so what is a pipeline program? You have this loop over here. You have different codes. Let's assume that there are three stages, A, B, C. Uh, you could execute this loop in a single processor like this, 
the first iteration, A from the first iteration, B from first iteration, C from the first iteration, A from the next iteration, B from the next iteration, C from the next iteration, dot, dot, dot. But you could also explo uh, exploit this or ex uh, execute this in a pipeline parallel manner on different processors. Assume that we have processor zero, processor one, processor two. Processor zero can be executing only A's, stage A, whatever code you have over here. Processor one can be executing only B's. Processor two can be executing only C's. Why might you want to do that? Well, the code that's over here may operate on some piece of data that has to stay local, let's say. And there may be very little communication between A and B. And the code that's operating on B over here may have a data set that is big and that should stay local. And they, they may, it might have very little communication with C. Now, if you partition your loop this way, now instead of parallelizing across loop iterations, you can parallelize within a loop iteration. And that's exactly what's happening over here. Processor zero executes A's. Processor one executes in the next cycle in a pipeline manner, as you can see, B's and processor two executes C's in a pipeline manner. This is your loop iteration execution. This is the next iteration. This is the next iteration, next iteration, next iteration. So as opposed to doing different iterations in parallel in different processors, as we've seen in GPUs, right? Uh, we're doing different stages in a pipeline manner in different processors. And we're exploiting stage level parallelism at any given point in time. The different processors are executing different stages, but from different iterations. That way you can parallelize within a loop as well. This is something we have not seen before, right? So that's the idea. Basically, you uh, divide a loop iteration into code segments called stages. It looks like this. And your threads execute stages on different cores. So core one gets stages uh, from uh, stage A, and then outputs the result to core two with a queue, software queue probably. It could be a hardware queue also. And core two executes B, instances of B, and core three executes instances of C. And people write programs this way all the time today. One example of this file is from file compression. For example, you can divide, uh, uh, divide things to be pipeline parallel. For example, if you're compressing many, many files at the same time, essentially what you have is a loop iteration that takes input as different files. And you can divide into stages that look like this. For example, you could allocate buffers in the first stage, and then you could read the input in the second stage. I'm not going to go through this in detail, clearly. You could do the compression. You could actually divide compression into many, many stages as well. And while you're compressing one file over here, another file may be being read, and another file may be being allocated. So you essentially have a pipeline. It's pipelined uh, parallelism uh, in programming, and it's systolic also. Uh, Hopefully that's clear, right? <laughs> and you can design processing elements to fit these di different requirements also. But this is essentially a programming model that's uh, inspired by systolic arrays. Okay, let's go back to the advanced and disadvantage a little bit more. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're gonna finish systolic arrays, we're gonna take a break after that. Uh, basically, the big advantage is you can make use, multiple uses of each data item. You reduce the need for fetching or refetching, better use of memory bandwidth. Never uh, uh, forget the importance of this. Because if you remember, in the SIMD processors, we put a lot of effort to supplying memory bandwidth. Here, we're doing something maybe smarter to make use of the available memory bandwidth as much as possible. High concurrency, clearly, and regular design. Both data and control flow are regular, but you need to orchestrate it. If you actually make a mistake as to when to supply the input, your output will be completely incorrect. And you will see that in the example that we're going to uh, give you in the homework. You might make a mistake and you'll get the wrong result completely. Well, this disadvantage is clear. Hopefully, it's not good at exploiting irregular parallelism or any other parallelism that doesn't fit the structure of the machine. So in that sense, it's similar to the SIMD machine, but maybe even more restricted than the SIMD machine because the structures that you can support are much smaller because you actually specialize the design for something else. So it's a relatively special purpose, which means that you need software and programmer support to be more general purpose, and also software and programmer support to take advantage uh, of underlying engine. So this is the, one of the first examples, actually, I believe the first example of a systolic array machine. H.T. Kung was the person who developed the concept and whose paper you're going to read. And the warp computer was the first instance of the computer he developed at CMU to show that this can actually work. 
uh, essentially it was a linear array of 10 cells, and each cell was a 10 megaflow programmable processor. So he didn't do the really specialized thing. He really went with a more programmable processor. It was attached to a general purpose host machine, just like GPUs were developed to begin with. Uh, and uh, uh, his group also developed a high-level language and optimizing compiler to actually program this systolic array such that you could get the highest throughput uh, out of this. And it was used extensively to accelerate vision and robotics tasks, as I uh, showed you earlier. And if you're really interested, there, there are a couple of beautiful papers that describe how this operates. But I'll give you some examples from that paper. This is essentially the systolic array that they developed. This is the host. It's a general purpose CPU. And then you interface to it. And the data that you supply to it goes through the processor array, programmable processors. But it, it is essentially a systolic array. And you can see that the inputs and outputs are relatively uh, programmable over here. And this is the cell, a single cell. If you actually want to zoom into a single cell, it looks like this. It's almost like a, a general purpose processor. It is actually a general purpose processor as long as you can have the interfaces to program it. You can see that there are memories, there are registers, uh, there are address registers, uh, memory registers, and dot, dot, dot. I think that's an additional add registers, not uh, address registers. So you could actually program this. Uh, uh, it's not as specialized as what I've shown you earlier that's designed just for convolution. Right? Okay. So a more modern systolic array looks like this. This is Google's paper from 2017 where they revealed the tensor processing unit. Now you know that it's essentially convolutions or whatever neural net or whatever, whatever filtering computations that they do on matrices. Maybe, maybe I, I shouldn't say just convolutions, but it's more matrix operations. In this case, it was matrix operations. You can see that uh, they say systolic data flow of the matrix multiply unit. This is really the heart of the tensor processing unit over here. You can see that there is control. They need to orchestrate the control. And the data flows this way. And basically, it says software has the illusion that each 256-bit input is read at once. And they instantly update one location of each of 256 accumulator ramps to do the matrix multiplication. And uh, you, can you can actually see over here, uh, a given 256 element multiply and accumulate operation moves through the matrix as a diagonal wave front, very similar to how a systolic array actually operates. The weights are preloaded, very similar to a systolic array again, and take effect with the advancing wave alongside the first data of a new block. Essentially, when the data appears, you, you actually do the multiplication of the weights. And control and data are pipelined to give the illusion that the 256 inputs are read at once and that they instantly update one location of each of 256 accumulators. From a correctness perspective, software is unaware of the systolic nature of the matrix unit, but for performance, it does worry about the latency of the unit. This is a very cryptic way of saying, we hid it from the programmer, but if you really want to get high performance out of it, you really need to know what's going on underneath. <laughs> That's essentially what they're saying over here. OK, so if you look at how this fits into the bigger system, clearly systolic array is not the only thing they want to do in their data centers. They want to do other stuff also, but they need to interface with the systolic array. And this is exactly how they interface with it. You can see the input numbers over here. They need to set up the data. They need to buffer the output. And they need to buffer the inputs also. And uh, they basically get the data out. And then they have a loop over here, essentially, to control it. And I'm not going to clearly describe it in this lecture, but you can read the paper uh, that I recommended if you would like to understand it. Although I'm not going to guarantee you that you're going to understand everything because the paper doesn't, paper is relatively lean on the details on exactly how it works for various reasons you can imagine. But the fundamentals remain the fundamentals. It's a systolic array. It does systolic computation. OK, this is the second generation, which I'm less familiar with. And this is a picture of it. Clearly, they figured out that this is really important for their business. You need to accelerate machine learning tasks. And machine learning tasks com consist of convolutions, matrix multiplications. And you do many, many of these because they have many, many data. So you need more TPU chips, uh, tensor processing unit chips. You need higher bandwidth memory because you're not done yet with the memory problem. Even though you're reducing the computation per data element, there is a lot more data that needs to come in. So you need higher bandwidth memory. You need to do more complicated operations, floating point operations. And clearly, you need to have more computation capability because there is a lot of data uh, if you want to scale with it. And they actually designed this so that they could do training as well as inference. We've discussed training and inference in the context of perceptrons, right? You train the perceptron such that it can predict the branch. You train it 
when you actually have the outcome of the branch and you use it for inference, inference is branch prediction based on the training that you've done. In this case, it's very similar. You train the neural network based on all the data that you have and when you're trying to figure out whether it's a cat or a dog or whether someone wrote X versus Y to Google Translate, it goes through those, it goes through an inference process to actually map whatever you've written uh, to an output uh, through the weights that were trained based on the input data. So this chip is capable of doing both of them actually, accelerating both of them. And usually training is actually a relatively hard task. Training is, training could be done relatively offline, if you will, although if you would like to get most up-to-date data, you would like to train your network as much as possible. But inference may require real-time constraints, right? Whenever I input something to Siri, which never understands what I say, that's why I don't use it. Uh, whenever I input something over here, I would like a good response back, right? That's inference. Training is what's needed to get inference done well, right? That, that doesn't have to happen right away. Okay, so this is a good place to stop and take a 10 minute break. Uh, after that, we'll finish the couple access and execute and we'll start with the memory hierarchy. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So now you know what's in uh, the machine learning accelerators of today, hopefully. At least one version, right? Because other people have different sort of accelerators as we covered last time. Okay, let's cover one last thing uh, for the execution paradigms. And I like covering this because I think it's a really, really good idea, an interesting idea. Part of it, some of the principles are employed in today, today's processors, but not all of them. But you may never know, maybe 20 years later, somebody will decide to accelerate something really important and you will see that that principle will be the heart of the design. Maybe one of you will be that person, right? Who knows? Just make sure you apply the concepts that you take in your courses and not just cram for the exams that are put in front of you. There are many, many ways of learning. Exams are only one way of maybe learning and maybe testing even, right? Okay, uh, decoupled access and execute. Uh, it's out of order, as you can see over here. This should really, really appear actually uh, somewhere over here. <laughs> but I didn't put it over there. I didn't want to break the flow uh, because it's, it's a different take uh, on out of order execution. And the motivation is really uh, the fact that the algorithms that we have introduced for out of order execution were considered to be complex to implement. And this is actually a true statement, I think. It's a relatively complex algorithm. Uh, people implemented it so that they could get very high performance out of it. But in the 1980s, before the first processors that implemented Pentium Pro, for example, or Motorola 88110, which is really the first processor that really implemented, in my opinion, but didn't really go anywhere. Uh, people thought that this was actually very complex to implement, so they were looking at alternative models. Uh, and uh, the idea in decoupled access and execute is very simple. It ha uh, the idea is to have very limited out of order execution. Not do the full blown Thomas Lowe's algorithm, but have two different parts of a machine, divide the machine into uh, operand access and execution components and have two instruction streams that feed these components and communicate via ISA visible queues. That was the original idea. Uh, now what this looks like is this. You basically have an access processor and an execute processor and these can slip with respect to each other. Sometimes access processor can go ahead, sometimes execute processor can go ahead depending on how long your memory accesses or execute operations take. So you could do a limited out of order, if you will, execution, because if you're relating for a memory access here, for example, you may have many, many execute operations uh, over here. And these communicate with each other through these queues. This is an access to execute queue. When the data comes back and that needs to be go to an add instruction, for example, it's supplied here. These are FIFO queues. And you could actually fill these queues. So the, how big these queues are determines how, how, much, how far ahead one processor can, can execute ahead of the other processor. That's the idea. If this queue has a thousand entries, this could actually fill this queue with a thousand different data results, and it could be a thousand, let's say, uh, data operations ahead of the execute processor. If this is running, uh, uh, running slow for some reason, uh, well, if, if, if this is running slow for some reason, execute processor can fill this with many, many operations, and this could be ahead, maybe a thousand uh, operations ahead. Uh, 
And there's branches that always cause a problem because branches determine what should you execute next. So you need to handle branches in a nice way. And we've seen how to handle branches, so I'm not going to cover this in a lot of detail. But the key idea is to have two different streams, access and execute, and let them slip from each other such that you have limited out-of-order execution capability without having all of that tag matching, wake up, select, uh, register renaming logic. In this case, you only have these queues that are FIFO, right, as opposed to the complicated tag matching logic. So that's the idea. Now, the idea is very powerful, and initially when it was proposed, uh, you can see that it has two, it, it changes the ISA, right, instruction set architecture. Uh, later, we will see an implementation which doesn't change the ISA, but steers the instructions to different queues, such that you can do this, you can get this ex execute decoupling uh, within a single instruction stream without changing the instruction set architecture. So you can have a hardware mechanism that takes a single program and steers the instructions to different queues, depending on whether they should be executed here or there. And as a result, you could get this decoupling. And this idea was proposed by Jim Smith, who actually was the author of the uh, a study of branch prediction strategies, the bimodal branch predictor, uh, in 1982. And this is one example. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the, the first incarnation of the idea is compiler generates two instruction streams, ex access and execute. Uh, you can see that this is the single-threaded program. It's actually one of the really, really interesting programs of the day. Uh, they use these Lawrence Livermore loops to test the performance of uh, the high-performance machines of their times. That's why it's important, and it does a lot of matrix operations. And you can see that if it's compiled to a Cray-1-like architecture, it looks like this. And if you actually compile it to an access execute decoupled, or decoupled access execute machine, this is what it would look like. You can see that access machine does uh, accesses and puts the result into an access execute queue. There are five for queues. Puts the next result into access execute queue, puts the next result into access execute queue. These are load instructions. You can see that. You load Z, K plus 10. You load Z, K plus 11. These are load instructions that go into the access execute queue, queues as opposed to registers. And this is another load, uh, this one over here. And you do some address computation over here, and then uh, you do whatever. Uh, I, I think uh, some of this are, it could be branching. Yeah, this is the branching part of it. You increment the index, essentially. Actually, it's not the branching. You increment the index so that uh, the loop can get the right index in the next iteration, and then you, you load from the right indices uh, in the array. And the execute processor does all the execute operations. You can see over here, uh, for example, this is a floating point multiply that goes into the execute processor. This is another multiply that goes into the execute processor. This is a floating point add that goes into the execute processor. And eventually the results, uh, it, you get a data element from the access execute queue, a FIFO queue, uh, you get the first element at the top of the queue, multiply it with the result that you generated, and put the result into the execute access queue. So the, the two processors communicate via these FIFO queues, and the compiler needs to ensure that they communicate correctly. For example, this one gets the result from the execute access queue over here. So that's the idea. It's very simple, very powerful. It leads to a machine that's decoupled. It doesn't have the complexity of out-of-order execution, but it does now have uh, different pieces of the program can go ahead of each other, depending on where the bottleneck is. Okay, so clearly you have a problem with branches. You need to synchronize the two, queue, uh, two processors on control flow instructions using branch queues, which I'm not going to go over, over here. So I've given you the concept. The big advantage is execute stream can run ahead of the access stream versus and vice versa, depending on what's the bottleneck. For example, if the access stream is waiting for memory, execute can perform useful work and can continue ahead without being blocked by a dependency. If uh, access stream hits in the cache, it can supply data to a lagging execute stream. That way, access stream can uh, go further ahead of the execute stream. Now, the upside is you have limited out-of-order execution capability this way, and you have relatively small complexity because in out-of-order execution, we need to have reservation stations. We need to have physical register files. We need to have a place to communicate those renamed uh, values, and all of the complexity of the tag matching. Here, somebody else has that complexity, and that's the queues. And somebody needs to orchestrate the data movement through those queues. But queues are simple. They're FIFOs, first and first out structures. And uh, they reduce the number of required registers also. If you look at this program over here, actually some of the registers that you needed to use over here are now renamed 
Actually, this is a sort of renaming. You're renaming the register at the compile time into a queue entry, essentially. Then queues are very simple structures. I don't know what happened. Okay, it's back. Queues are very simple structures. It's not like a register file. So that actually reduces the complexity of the processor, uh, even compared to a relatively simple in-order processor potentially. Okay, that's the idea. So I already said that. You have limited out-of-order execution capability without the complexity of tag matching, tag broadcast, wake up and select, renaming, dot, dot, dot. The disadvantage is you need to have compiler support. You need to somehow partition the program and manage the queues. And the way you do this determines the amount of decoupling that you have. Clearly, the out-of-order execution capability is now limited by how well you do this partitioning. And we're back to the branches. <laughs> Here now, the decoupling somehow depends on the synchronization between access and execute streams. If you actually have a branch somewhere in the middle, you need to ensure that you're on the correct path, right? It's the same branch problem that we have over here. And another disadvantage is you have multiple instruction streams. We're dividing the program into two different instruction streams that somehow communicate with each other. But as I said, this can actually be done with a single one, but you need to design it even more carefully if you have a single instruction stream. I'm not going to go over the details of uh, how you do it exactly with a single one, but this is actually one example uh, of how it was done. And this is actually a beautiful paper that talks about it by Jim Smith again, uh, the Astronautics ZS1 processor. Uh, essentially, you have a single instruction stream. Uh, you fetch the instructions, and you decide whether you put it into the access instruction pipeline or execute instruction pipeline, which operates separately, as you can see. And you can actually have a copy unit also, as you can see. So you can copy uh, some instructions from here to there or here to there, dot, 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 uh, and data. Uh, as a result, this is, each pipeline is in order over here. So it's a very simple pipeline here and there. But each pipeline can slip with respect to each other. So if this is blocked for whatever reason, this can make progress. If this is blocked for whatever reason, this can make progress. If they're both blocked, good luck. So if that's where it loses to out-of-order execution. If they're both blocked because of a data dependency, they're not going to move because these are in-order pipelines. But an out-of-order execution machine can find instructions much farther in the execution stream that are independent, and it can still continue getting high performance by scheduling those instructions. So that's the downside compared to an out-of-order execution machine. It's not as powerful, but it's much, much simpler. So it exploits some part of out-of-order independence uh, in the instruction stream, the independence between the access and execute streams. OK, if you're more interested, these, these are actually really beautiful papers that describe how this works, how they design the compiler to take advantage of it. So one of the big techniques that they use, which was discussed by Juan earlier, is loop unrolling so that you can eliminate the branches uh, and actually enable more parallelism and enable many, many things. Loop unrolling, if you remember, essentially, as opposed to having a single thing in a loop, you put multiple loop iterations uh, by replicating the loop body multiple times within an iteration. That's the idea. Uh, so the upside is this reduces the loop maintenance overhead. You have fewer branches in the code. Here we increment the induction variable or loop condition test every four operations as opposed to every one operation, as you can see. Uh, it enlarges the basic block, as you can see as opposed to having branches after every single operation. You have branches after every four operations in this example. It enables code optimization and scheduling opportunities, as we've discussed. Uh, if you eliminate branches, that's good for scheduling opportunities. There are downsides, clearly. What if the iteration count is not a multiple of the unroll factor? So you need to take into account that. So you need to have extra code to detect this. If, for example, n is 5, you need to do one more iteration at the end. Uh, or one more statement at the end. This is very similar to the vector strip mining that we've discussed, right? You strip mine. This is the desirable part. You want, you want to get to the gold. This is the gold. But you want to get through the dirt to get to the gold. And the dirt is that additional iteration that you need to do, right? That's how you strip mine. Uh, and one of the other downsides is potentially increases the code size because of uh, all of this stuff. It could eliminate some instructions, though, as you can see uh, over here. So that's, that's not always clear. Uh, OK, so you've seen loop unrolling, but this is a fundamental technique to take advantage of a, a processor uh, like uh, 
uh, like the Astronautics DS1, which does decoupled access and execute. This is, another, this is also a technique that to take advantage of all of the VLIW or statically scheduled processors that do not have dynamic scheduling uh, support. Okay, we have examples of a modern decoupled access and execute, although many people don't realize that these are examples of decoupled access and execute. They're relatively small examples because they do not really take the fundamental in orderness concept of decoupled access and execute, but they do decoupling. So if you look at Pentium 4, uh, you have the memory operations that go through the memory scheduler, you have the integer operations that go through the integer scheduler. So they're really decoupled in the machine and they can slip with respect to each other. In fact, these queues were relatively long in, uh, uh, in Pentium 4. For example, if your memory queue is backed up, your integer queue can still be making a lot of progress. And it could be backed up if this is actually a relatively long thing. So this is a very limited example of a decoupled access execute idea uh, implemented in real processors. And this is a simplified example from my own picture. I like simplifying these ugly pictures and creating other ugly pictures like this. But I think this is a simpler ugly picture compared to the complex ugly picture. Uh, basically, you can see that uh, there's decoupling that's happening between the memory and integer, ex uh, integer execute, but you can also have floating point uh, execute decoupling as well, right? Okay, so hopefully you've got the ideas. I think we're done with the instruction level concurrency approaches, uh, and it's time to move to memory. Does it, does it feel good to be done? So we've covered a lot of processing paradigms, actually, which you may not get to cover in your life again. So hopefully you will like uh, what you've covered. And that's the purpose of 23A, because now we have a 23B coming. But that requires me to context switch.